Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we're going to be talking about some of the MSI Afterburner malware that's out there. Important PSA for those of you who do any kind of overclocking or system tuning to be aware of where you're downloading Afterburner. It's probably the leading tool at this point for GPU fan speed management and overclocking and anything to do with uh, tuning the video card, especially since EVGA Precision is dead. So really important that you're aware of where you get the tool. We'll also be talking about leaks about Ryzen 7900 and 7700 non-X CPUs. We're going over the 13900KS that's been listed online as well. So that's a higher end SKU of Intel's top end CPUs. And a couple of other things like water-cooled ARC GPUs, something different. And this will be the last news episode we film locally for a little while because we're about to board a plane to go out to do our factory tours on the other side of the world. So let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Arctic and the Liquid Freezer 2 liquid coolers, now including an ARGB model in the lineup. The Liquid Freezer series has been a top performer in our benchmark for years now, and Arctic has continually fine-tuned its products even post-launch with things like kits for Ryzen, ARGB fans for new flare, and new radiator sizes. The company also has its brand new MX6 thermal paste on the market now. Learn more at the links in the description below. All right, so this is going to be a really efficient news video. MSI Afterburner, if you don't know, is a GPU tuning software. You can use it just for fan curves or for overclocking. And MSI posted a PSA on its Facebook page, this is where we first became aware of the issue, where it made sort of a, a meme that was warning against downloading Afterburner from websites that sound an awful lot like an official MSI Afterburner website, but are not. It's the typical stuff where you've got MSI Afterburner dot some weird top level domain. So uh, this is something that Cybel, which is a cybersecurity group, recently posted about. They're the ones who sort of published the research on this and did the research on the uh, vulnerability here. And it posted an informational piece about fake iterations of Afterburner that run coin mining software in the background for crypto. Cybel noted that the attack works pretty simply. It just has alternatives to MSI Afterburner online scattered through download sites, and it uses names that appear legitimate. Variations that we're not going to read here just to protect the viewers. The only name we want you to have in your head for getting Afterburner is MSI.com. So as long as MSI hasn't been compromised there, that version of the software should be the legitimate one, with that one caveat there. But uh, short of them losing control over their own servers, that's where you get it. Now, for how this works, it installs an XMR miner on the system, and uh, it then runs that in the background, so it's able to use your GPU for mining, for crypto mining. I don't know, you do this against millions of computers, if you're truly successful in your software, software malware deployment, then uh, it'd potentially be pretty significant. But it does a little more than that too. It also collects personal information that could be identifying on the computer itself. Uh, feasibly, you could use this type of attack vector to maybe hunt around on the user's computer for, um, uh, what are they, is it? The, the, the words, the secret words <laughs> for the wallet. Uh, you could also use it for key logging, for um, gaining access to user accounts on websites like banking accounts. So uh, bad software to have, have an MSI's official website, only place to get it. If you've downloaded Afterburner recently, it's worth checking where you got it from and, uh, and probably not visiting that site again if it's not just MSI.com. Now, some people like Guru3D and stuff like that will host Afterburner, and unless they're compromised, the Guru3D has been a long-running source for Afterburner as well, so you don't have to be scared of all of them, but just take some caution. Next one, 7900 and the 7700 non-X CPUs. These are getting pretty interesting now. Uh, this is getting lined up by AMD. It's the lower TDP versions of their new Ryzen or Zen 4 CPUs, Ryzen 7000 CPUs. So these specific versions are the 12 core and 8 core processors. And again, it's just the non-X variants. Serial leaker on Twitter, Momomo underscore US, shared a screenshot of a French retailer listing the two processors as Lenovo branded SKUs. The site, PC21.fr, still has the listings for the 7800 and the 7700 up at the time of writing. And interestingly, base clocks in the part name are listed at 3.6 gigahertz, which is a lot lower than the 4.7 gigahertz of the 7800X or 4.5 of the 7700X. There's a few options here. So on one end, you could basically just be taking a 7900X or a 7700X 
and effectively running it out of the box in an eco mode equivalent by forcing down the TDP and constraining the power budget. And we showed in our 7950X eco mode testing that uh, it would potentially make sense for AMD to just ship lower TDP SKUs that are more or less pre eco moded to 7000 series CPUs because you retain most of the performance but you gain back a lot of efficiency. So that's kind of what this looks like it's going towards. As for why you would potentially do that instead of just shipping the highest performing version of the SKU and telling people, well, if you want it to be more efficient, then turn it on. Uh, it's the basics. It's what you always run into of as soon as you have to toggle something, the vast majority of end users, no fault of their own, they're just not interested in it or don't follow it, will not turn that thing on because they might not be aware it exists or they don't really care to research what it does. And that's totally fine. There's a lot of things and products that I buy outside of technology that I don't really care to learn about because I just don't have time for it. I'm not personally interested in it. So can totally get that. And that's where the uh, segmentation here, dropping the X skew would make some sense. Now, now, this would also solve some of the 95 degree concerns you have where uh, not concerns in terms of product longevity necessarily, but concerns in terms of technical support of there's all these decades of forum threads about 95 degrees is too hot and is throttling. That behavior has changed now, but depending on where users land when they're researching their 95 degree Ryzen 7000 CPU, it could cause some confusion. Now, if these CPUs are legitimate, and they probably are at this point, the pricing and the stock behavior will be important to pay attention to because if they're power limited and therefore lower performance, the price will of course have to be lower to make sense as a product. But if they're cheaper and just easily set to the same TDP or the same limits as the original X counterparts, these would be awesome for enthusiasts and would make a lot of sense for people to buy instead of the X SKUs, kind of like the 1600 and the 1600X in the past. Uh, it would make a lot less sense for AMD, but just depends on their market. And if they're shipping this with Lenovo, then uh, an OEM thing, they might not worry too much about enthusiasts getting their hands on it and clocking them up. So uh, we're going to be covering these as soon as they become an official thing. We're guessing CES makes the most sense for these, but um, th that's only because that's the next major trade show where AMD announces stuff. And on that note too, CES is currently the rumored venue for the next 3D vCache part to come out, which is going to be a Zen 4 part, probably a 7600X3D or something like that. And uh, CES is the first week of January, if you want to pay attention to it and see what happens. Up next, Intel and the special edition i9-13900KS. The S stands for special edition. And this is a follow-up to the 13900K. The KS, as usual, is a higher clock variant of Intel's top performing part right now. And it's otherwise identical to a 13900K. So same core count, same e-core count, same cache, same all architecture, everything underlying is just the frequency is boosted up to six gigahertz according to the screenshots that are online now. So video cards with a Z screenshotted PC Canada's listing or uh, maybe got it through Momo US. Either way, there's a few screenshots out there of a retailer's listing showing the 13900KS at 972 Canadian dollars or simply converted 715 US. We recently saw the i9-13900K CPUs available in the US for anywhere between 620 to $660 on say Amazon, uh, depending on the variant and if it was like a Black Friday sale or something. So at 660, that put the 13900KS as minimally 8.3% more expensive if it does land at 715. And uh, that'll change obviously, depending on where it lands in, in once it's out, but Momo underscore US on Twitter posted screenshots as well, suggesting the six gigahertz advertised clock on the KS. And if you look at the 13900K spec, that one is advertised at 5.8 gigahertz. So the KS pushes about 200 megahertz more, uh, closer to the limit, and about as close as you can get without just manually overclocking it as a user. So uh, I don't know if we'll review this one standalone or not, but we might do some OC with it just for fun. Next, EK, making some water blocks. I don't really know why I said it like uh, as if that's news. That's kind of what they do. EK is specifically making arc water blocks. So EK just validated Intel and their GPU efforts by committing to high-end water blocks for the relatively mid-range A770 and A750 GPUs. Water blocks on cards cheaper than $400 are never economical, really. And at $250 for the A750 and A770 quantum vector squared blocks, that's especially true because you're talking about cards that really are nearly equivalent in price depending on which model you buy, like the 300 for the A770. So the price delta would be better spent on something like an RX 6800 or an RTX 3070, 
But if you needed ARC GPUs and you wanted them as tightly packed as possible, or just you like water cooling because it looks cool, then this would be the block to look at because uh, it's going to be better thermal management than air coolers. Totally irrelevant, honestly, for the level of performance and heat that these chips produce. So you really don't have to worry about this unless you're in a specific use case, in which case uh, you already know you need it if you're cramming a bunch of them in a system or something. Uh, EK is including a black backplate with these, and the water blocks will be shipping in a nickel plexi solution. Up next, bike ski. Big bike sky. We're going to go with bike ski again. Bike ski is expanding its line of all in one uh, external water cooling solutions to include a 1080 version. Very large. It has a nine 120 millimeter fans on it. So it's uh, pretty close to car radiator. It's pretty close to truck radiator size. These enclosures contain a radiator, a pump, a reservoir, a water level indicator, and fans all in one box. All you need after this are the water blocks for the components, the fittings, the tubing to connect the external and the internal cooler to the PC, and obviously the parts themselves. You'll also need a wide space because the 1080 version measures 420 millimeters tall by 488 millimeters long and then uh, 138 millimeters for the depth. So they'll need to go either on the floor or require enough desk to have your PC and this on it at the same time. Honestly, though, this kind of stuff, it's fun. It's like the, uh, the water cool solution. That's the name of the brand. The Mora, the Mora 3, if you've never heard of it, you haven't seen us use it in OC streams, go look up MO-RA3 from Watercool. That's kind of what this reminds us of, except that's just a radiator. It is really fun to play around with, totally impractical for most people. But if you have a use case for it, it's, it's pretty different, and that's what we liked about it. Anyway, this, uh, so the power for the pump and the fans is provided by an included four pin adapter that requires the user to get four pin Molex power over to wherever the unit ends up sitting. So you could do something like an AC to DC power adapter. That would make sense. It's a little bit awkward. You need to be careful about the spec that you use for it. Um, and we would need one of these here to really look into it and give you an answer for that. But that's an option. Otherwise, you're straining Molex cables on, making a Molex centipede somewhere and uh, shoving it through a hole in the case. And we also don't see an obvious way to control fan and pump speed. So you're probably stuck with the way it comes out of the box, creative modding aside. A bike ski also offers smaller sizes. But to us, external coolers make the most sense when they're gigantic, like this one. If you do have the space, this kind of thing can make it relatively easy to have the power of water cooling without as much fitment hassle in the case. The idea in general isn't new at all. So those of you who've been building a long time, remember when water cooling was actually primarily outside of the case, technically, you normally sit it on top of the case or something. And um, this is going back to sort of that era. It does make it easier to work with in some ways, harder in terms of space utilization. And um, in theory, you could drive down your noise levels really low or potentially even run some of these passive with a low enough heat load. It, it, pretty low heat load, but like the more a three could handle a CPU alone for some of the ones we were working with at the time, no fans at all. Uh, the 1080 external solution, it's going to be around $560. It'll be out near the end of this year. It sounds like a lot of money, but it's actually not a bad price considering the pure, the, just the amount of metal there is and the weight and the hardware included, especially considering it's all assembled and ready to go. So as far as water cooling prices go, that's comparable. It's still a high price just in an objective or absolute sense, but versus other water cooling parts, not so bad. I mean, that's like a little over twice what just the one block for an ARC GPU costs. Up next, Galax is introducing another new Hall of Fame graphics card, but it's not a 4090 or a 4080. It's the much anticipated uh, 3060 Ti GDDR6X Hoff Pro. A 3060 Ti Hall of Fame card. So Galax, like EVJ with the KP series previously, gets a lot of press and attention for its Hall of Fame cards as they should. They're impressive cards. It's the type of thing you're like, you walk onto the car lot, you're like, that's pretty cool. I'll never own it. But hey, it's kind of cool. Uh, except this is a 3060 Ti. So it's a little bit off brand and kind of weird. They've done this before. A little weird though. And maybe now without uh, Kinpin to compete with, they've decided now is the chance. Now they can really claim the 3060 Ti throne on hardware bot or something. 
So anyway, this is a GPU from the end of 2020, as a reminder. But it's been refreshed. So NVIDIA is doing a refresh here. It's a GDDR6X model, and it actually has a higher 225 watt total graphics power. It's 25 watts more than the original 3060 Ti spec. And that's with GDDR6 without the X for the original one, which obviously is, I mean, lower end. But uh, as for how much it actually matters on a 3060 Ti, uh, it's kind of questionable. You're going to get more out of that frequency bump from the power. Back to the Hall of Fame card, though, it features the classic whiteout PCB and triple fan cooler with a few blue accents on it. The TGP is actually even higher on the Hall of Fame one. It's 265 watts, so even more than stock. Power is delivered via standard PCIe 8-pin connectors, also made of white plastic. And the board appears to have LEDs connected to the power cable detection circuit that are visible through a cutout in the backplate. White LEDs indicate both 8 pins are fully detected, and red LEDs indicate that all pins are not connected, likely preventing the card from starting up. So a lot of partners have had features like this particular one in the past. It's just they're coming down to lower end um, cards here, which is a little out of place. You're starting to spend money on all these small little things that make a high end card nice, but make a low end one kind of push into the territory of the next model up. Accessories with the card will include a GPU support bracket, a motherboard LED control cable, and some all-white cable extensions. Now, back in 2016, we had to do some digging to find this one, but Galax also made a GTX 1060 Hall of Fame card. And uh, the main reason we can figure out maybe these make sense is because it opens up for the competitive OC scene, something where you don't have the budget for an 80 or 90 or Titan series card. You're not going to hit first place on just the total chart, but you might be able to hit first place on this particular class of card for chart uh, performance. So maybe that's why they do it. But yeah, practically speaking, you should obviously just buy a different card uh, if you're not going to actually OC it for real. Next up, Samsung stacks GDDR6W, uh, which is new memory, on top of metaverse bullshit. Samsung announced a new packaging of DRAM called GDDR6W. This is a stacked version of regular GDDR6 that allows for doubled capacity and bandwidth by having two physical layers of DRAM silicon inside the package. This is an actual technological advancement. It's a good one. But Samsung wasted no time in diverting all attention from it by layering on the metaverse marketing. Even the press release title starts with, quote, a bridge between worlds. It's too easy to make fun of stuff like this, so instead, we're going to read some quotes. Quote, as advanced graphics and display technologies develop, they are blurring the lines between metaverse and our everyday experience. Quote, high bandwidth graphics memory solution, the key to hyperreal capital gaming and capital digital twin. This is, it's another classic example of like actually cool technology. Just, and, and someone writing the press releases for this said, this is kind of boring, the like stacking and the fact that you can fit more memory in a smaller footprint and you don't have to do memory on the backside of a PCB anymore. Like, what do we do to get, what do we do to get people interested? And for some reason, they went to Metaverse, which lately, I mean, Metaverse gets people interested, but it's not for the right reason. It's probably because they're looking for a job now. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Zuckerberg. Thank, thanks, Mark. Now, unfortunately, Samsung doesn't show how many more Mark Zuckerbergs per second the new memory can render, but it does tell us a little bit about the memory. So it found a way to mention ray tracing to hit that buzzword and create a new unit of measurement at the same time. Samsung claims that it takes 60 to 140 pages of data for one second of ray tracing. So that unit, kind of like FPS is frames per second or MHZ is megahertz, uh, GBPS might be gigabits per second, depending on the capitalization. This is a new one called PODPSORT. Super cool. So for the pages of data for one second of ray tracing, uh, what Samsung's actually trying to say <laughs> is that higher fidelity assets and more immersive graphics require faster DRAM, and their new GDDR6W does that. All of that aside, after we dug through most of the press release, we did finally get to the actual information. Here it is. So fundamentally, GDDR6 memory, the same stuff that Samsung's been making, is in GDDR6W. 
So the core of G6 that we know is still there, but it's packaged in a different way. So there's new packaging technology getting deployed here, and that allows double the capacity in the same physical area. And, well, at least, yeah, area, not volume, but area. And the area the package takes up on the board is unchanged, but the height or the thickness of the package actually ends up being less. There's process changes here too. So Samsung claims that it's a 36% reduction in the height or the thickness of the package. And it says this is achieved by packaging the DRAM silicon with Metaverse distribution. I, I'm just kidding. It's actually achieved by packaging the DRAM silicon with redistribution layers, or RDL they call it, made of more silicon rather than a PCB. So embedding the electrical connections this way allows for far finer traces, therefore requiring less physical space. The two RDLs within the package are connected via copper posts within the package, making Samsung's render look like some kind of ancient tomb. This silicon die stacking is reminiscent of AMD's 3D vCache on the 58X 3D. Just this time, it's memory stacked on top of memory. And Samsung calls this fan out wafer level packaging. Uh, fan out packaging is something that we actually talked about with AMD, one of their engineers. Uh, in our recent interview on RDNA 3, if you're curious to learn more about fan-out technology. So using older methods of stacking would have resulted in actually a taller package, unless they did some sort of die sanding, with potentially worse thermal and power characteristics, and then you're also introducing more height, which is problematic potentially for cooler design reasons. So Samsung says it's been able to avoid these problems with its new method. With this approach, then, each module can have pretty high density of 32 gigabits per package, which is four gigabytes of, of capacity. It's eight bits in a byte, and uh, this kind of byte and bit. And that would potentially get a 16 gigabyte video card down to, for example, just four packages of memory using the new VRAM while being able to reduce the footprint and thus reduce the size of the PCB uh, if they wanted to anyway, and also keep the same bandwidth in theory. So pretty cool stuff. Alternatively, a card with, I don't know, eight four gigabyte packages <laughs> would be at 32 gigabytes. And that potentially improves the bandwidth as well. So the configuration there would bring the total theoretical bandwidth purely by Samsung numbers here up to 1.4 terabytes per second. Samsung points out that that's not far from HBM2E, a high bandwidth memory 2E territory, which is 1.6 terabytes per second. So assuming a four package HBM layout, you'd be at only 2.2 uh, .2 terabytes per second higher than the new memory solution at a similar capacity. And HBM has other problems that delayed its rollout wide to the market. So for example, interposer solutions are really expensive for HBMs. The packaging technology and process is expensive. And that's what kind of pushed HBM out of the market as a consumer class solution at large. You still see it in some places, but for the most part, only in older stuff from uh, AMD, for example. Anyway. Pretty cool stuff. Assuming Samsung's claims are true here, it's a big step. It will enable higher, at least capacity video cards to come out, potentially higher performing ones as well. And G6W was standardized by JEDEC as well. So it's a formal thing now in the second quarter of 22. It's expected to end up in laptops, data center, and uh, data center compute accelerators and desktop video cards sometime in the not too distant future. So that one's interesting. And uh, it's unfortunate about the metaverse stuff, but we did like the story otherwise. Check back for more. We'll be covering additional news stories throughout the week. We have some cool prototype uh, uh, products we can't talk about yet that we'll get to see while we're in Taiwan. And you'll learn about that soon on the channel. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.